Intimate Judaism deals with sensitive topics and uses explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Intimate Judaism. I'm Tally Rosenbaum. And I'm Rabbi Scott Kahn. And today we'll be talking about difficulties that face many Orthodox people in finding a spouse. We'll do that by speaking to Dr. Michael Salomon and Dr. Naomi Rosenbach. Looking forward to our conversation, Tali. Yeah, me too. I um, didn't know that the Shidduch crisis was something that was related to the experience of the modern Orthodox community. Even the idea of Shidduchim is not quite as common in the, I would say, left of centrist Orthodox circles. So I was really interested in hearing specifically about the research that's going to be presented today. We have two wonderful guests who have done some research on Orthodox Jewish Shidduch dating, And I think this encompasses, and we'll ask our guests soon, this encompasses the yeshivish Orthodox and the modern Orthodox communities. So I'm really looking forward to a very rich conversation. We'll get to the conversation in just a moment. First, remember to check out our website, IntimateJudaism.com, for a full podcast archive, show notes, a free men's mikvah checklist, and more. Subscribe to Intimate Judaism wherever you get your podcasts, rate and review, and please leave a comment. Tell people about Intimate Judaism and share the podcast so that we can continue to grow our audience. Our past three months have been our biggest three months of all time, and we're so gratified and grateful that you've helped us make this podcast so successful. Make sure to join the Intimate Judaism team on Patreon. Patreon supporters get bonus material episodes, merch, and more. You can find the link in the description of the podcast and in the show notes. Write to us at IntimateJudaism at JewishCoffeeHouse.com and visit JewishCoffeeHouse.com and TallyRosenbaum.com. And I guess without further ado, Tali, I'll introduce our two guests. Dr. Michael Salomon is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and an APA Presidential Citation Awardee, recognized for his work in the field of trauma, abuse, and resiliency. His books include The Shidduch Crisis, Causes and Cures, and Abuse in the Jewish Community. Dr. Naomi Rosenbach is the author of several professional journal articles, highlighting her interest in researching cultural and religious aspects that influence mental health and well-being in the Jewish community. Michael and Naomi, thank you both for being with us today. Pleasure. Thank you for having us. The reason that we're speaking with you is that there was an article a few days ago in the Jerusalem Post that alerted us to a study you did about what you call the Shidduch crisis, which is a term I want to ask about as well. But just as a means of opening up, could you explain and give a summary, perhaps, of what the study was about and what its findings basically were? Yeah, sure. So the intent of the original study was to gather numbers on marriage rates in the Frum community. And yes, Tali, I agree, the Shidduch crisis and struggle in Shidduchim has been spoken about more in the Yeshivish community than in the modern Orthodox community. Yet it was being spoken about without a lot of facts, without a lot of evidence. So a couple of colleagues uh, and a group of people decided to run a study and see if we can get some hard data and provide numbers. Uh, So that was one goal of the study. When we were doing this, Actually, when we were piloting this study and asking people to answer questions about themselves and their family members, whether they were single or married and at what age they got married, uh, the response, the piloters' responses were, that's it, that's all you want from us. Boy, do I have so much more to say about this subject. And people were begging, dying to tell us their thoughts and experiences and opinions and really a lot of a lot of their painful experiences. So we decided to provide them with an outlet and boy, did they respond. So when the responses started coming in, this became uh, a very rich and meaningful part of the study in its own right. So that gave us, between these two aspects, we had some information about marriage rates, both in the yeshivish and modern Orthodox community. And then we had some information about the experience of daters. The study kind of piggybacked on the book that I wrote back in 2008, The Shit of Crisis, which was primarily based on anecdotes about what people are going through, what people were telling me they were going through, what some of my own children were going through, even within the modern Orthodox world. So the fact that we were getting information from a variety of sources made this um, open-ended question that was attached to the study that much more rich for me and for the study itself. What would be helpful, I think, is to go through a little bit of your study design, 
the number of participants, how they broke down in terms of demographics. If you were looking at participants only in the United States or in other areas of the world, and then you can jump in with the conclusions of your study. And I know that that's a lot, but that will really give us some background so that we can ask you further questions. Okay. Um, I don't have all that information memorized, but I can provide, I guess, ballpark information. And we're really talking about two studies here, because one I refer to as the quantitative, um, and that's the marriage rates, and the other one is the qualitative, and that's the experience of daters. So the way the study was designed is that you were allowed to answer the study for yourself and your entire family unit. And we did that to reduce response bias. So this wasn't a random sample. This was a snowball effect study. And with that, you have limitations and a possibility of response bias. So that was one way we decreased it. So people started to answer questions such as their marriage status, if they were married, their age of marriage, if they've ever been divorced. And they answered those same questions for themselves and all their siblings or themselves and all their children, depending on, on how old they were. So we started to get this information on family units. So somewhere between three and 4,000 individuals were the responders themselves and they answered the study. But because we had the information on their siblings and children, we ended up having this demographic information on over 10,000 individuals. It was a bit skewed towards yeshiva orthodox population. So probably 60% were more yeshivish and a little bit less uh, in the modern Orthodox, but we had a lot of thousands of uh, participants within each group. In terms of the qualitative study, about 800 individuals decided to talk about their experiences. 800 out of the almost 4,000? Yes. Okay, so that's a very small ratio proportionally. Still, it's a pretty large uh, number of subjects who responded yes. in and of itself. And if you look yes. at some of the prior studies, you'll see that they have maybe 10, 12, 20 subjects in the group. We have here over 800 responses. That's a lot of reading. Yeah, a lot of reading, right. And it was the only question that was optional. So I think whenever you have an optional question on a survey, the response rate really decreases. So to even get a 20% response rate uh, or so on an optional question was pretty good. And geographically, where were they? Where were they located, the respondents? Primarily North America. Let's get a overview of your most salient findings. Would you like to talk about the qualitative findings, the seven categories? I think that would be the most interesting to our listeners, I think, is to get a sense of, I'm not sure how you combine the information, but you know, even just snippets of qualitative information. And I'm sure you add the themes together as is done in qualitative research. So I'm sure you came up with certain repetitive themes. Yes, that's exactly how we did it. I guess before we even jump into the qualitative, I can give an overall, I guess, so what the surprises on the quantitative were. So in the American yeshivish community, because the shidduch crisis has even be, been termed a crisis, and because it's spoken about so much in, in so many news outlets, I think people assumed that the rate of singles was higher. Like when I would ask people before we did the study, what's the rate of singlehood? in the community. I think people thought that 20 and even as much as 30% of women weren't getting married. So in that sense, it was a bit su surprising. We found the rates to be much lower than that. By the mid thirties, 90 something percent of women were married. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a significant percentage that were struggling and weren't married. Um, but I think that that has the potential to alleviate anxiety all around. In the modern Orthodox communities, the number were higher, were higher. This community is not talking about it as much. Numbers are higher of those who are unmarried, in other words. Correct. Yes. Okay. And when you say that they're not talking about it as much, do you find that that's because of there's less communicated distress about it? Uh, no, I don't think that's the case at all. I just think that they're, they're not talking about it, at least not not in a, in a large, open, foreign type of way. I'd like to make a suggestion about that, and you can tell me if this is completely off. I know some people who live in the modern Orthodox world who are single, and not single by choice, and they don't like it being called a crisis. And I wonder if that's part of it also, not talking about it as much. I can't speak for them, but from what I understand, calling it a shidduch crisis, at least in some segments of the modern Orthodox world, among those who are in that crisis, they feel that they are seen as a problem that has to be solved as opposed to being looked at as individuals 
they don't want to be grouped into that sort of big mass of people who need to get married who aren't married. They live their lives and they don't like being called a problem or a crisis. And I wonder if maybe you can comment on this, if perhaps that's part of the difference, which is that maybe in the more right-wing orthodox communities, considering it a crisis is something which those who are affected would accept and therefore they're willing to talk about it. Whereas in a perhaps more individualistic modern orthodox society, looking at it as a crisis per se, itself is a non-starter. Is that correct or am I off base here? I think a portion of that is probably accurate, but I think you have to look at it in terms of the distribution of the age of when people get married with the modern Orthodox world. If they're married in their 20s, they they don't have a crisis and they won't talk about a crisis. If they're not married in their 20s, then they're thinking that something's very wrong and maybe there is a crisis. But in order to rationalize that they're not married by the time they're in their 30s, they don't want to talk about it anymore. They will, they will suddenly switch to not suddenly. They'll develop this uh, rationalization to um, deal with the fact that they're not married by saying that they've chosen to be more independent, of uh, chosen a career path. They want to take their time, whatever the the, the the rationalization they use. So the word crisis doesn't crop up as much in the 30s as it does in the 20s. Hmm. I guess I would respond to that too. I personally don't like the word crisis. I've tried very hard to refrain from using it. Dr. Solomon and I have both have. Every time the word crisis is used in our research publications, it's when somebody else puts that term on it, actually without asking us permission. So I'm, I'm happy I have the opportunity to say that out loud. And I've gotten that feedback from, from people that exactly what you said, they don't want to be seen as a problem to be solved. And and for that very reason, I don't like to use the word crisis. That being said, is this a problem in semantics? Does that mean that they're not struggling and they don't want to be married and that the process of dating is extremely difficult for them? I mean, I think that from, and then we can get into the qualitative, um, our qualitative study shows that people are in a lot of pain. It's become a very difficult experience, no matter what you label it. Right. I mean, I was going to say, I think that, you know, maybe what you were saying before, Michael, about how more modern Orthodox people might be more likely to rationalize or defend by saying, I don't want to be just about being married. I have a life and I want to be able to continue to develop myself. I don't know that that really takes away from the isolation, the loneliness, also the fact that even in modern Orthodox communities, single people can feel very marginalized because our communities are very much designed to accommodate couples and families, and they don't accommodate as well people who are single. So there's a lot here. And I think that since we're specifically talking about dating, I know that we want to hear from you, but I also want to know and if this is something you studied in terms of, I know you mentioned it in your study. You know, we know this. We know that, we, and we also have a prior podcast, I think, from our first or second season about forced marriage. And this came about because of the unorthodox and kind of looking at Hasidic marriages where you have one basho and then, you know, you have the vort and really young people are not given very much autonomy at all. So going from there to, let's say, the yeshivish type of shidduch system and then towards the modern Orthodox, I think we can say that there is some variation in the ways that couples meet and date. And that probably came up quite a bit in your research as well. There are a variety of ways that people in the modern Orthodox world meet. More and more over the last, I'd say, 10 years or so, there's this move towards um let's call it the shidduch type approach, even when there are allegedly co-ed types of uh, get-togethers, there's usually someone who has to act as a, a shadchan to introduce the man to the woman. Uh, it, it, it's becoming more and more de rigueur um, in, in, in what we're seeing. Again, this is anecdotal. We don't really have hard data on it, but the, the times that I've been asked to speak at such meetings, men are on one side, women are on the other side, and if uh, somebody wants to meet someone of the opposite gender, they have to speak to somebody who will introduce them. And there are usually these shadchanim there who do that introduction. It's not as easy free-flowing as it used to be. And why do you think that is? I wish I had a good answer for that. Um, uh, I guess there's a, maybe somewhat of a religious creep of sorts, which is on some level a good thing, but on other levels may not be. I mean, one of the things 
that came up in the study is the retention rate among the modern Orthodox. In this particular study, 40% um, en ended up leaving, but 30% ended up going to yeshivish. So there's this pull towards this more right wing type of approach to dating and, and life in general. Michael, could you explain what those numbers, 40% of who is moving in one direction, 30% of which demographic are you speaking about? Are you speaking of singles? What, what are we talking about? Well, well, the respondents in the study, that's the 40% in the modern Orthodox world. These are all singles? No, no, not no, necessarily. No, no, not all single, not necessarily. Not necessarily. When we look at just the singles, there's a higher rate uh, of mo those that were raised modern Orthodox that end up leaving religion. So this is the whole population. So it's interesting. It, it's actually, it was actually about 26% of the ones that were raised modern Orthodox that moved to Yeshivish. Another 2% moved to Hasidish or Chabad, uh, and about 10 to 11% to non-religious. I think it's understandable in a sense the move towards not religious when you're single. It's hard to kind of keep it going when so much of religion is based on a familial family structure. And I don't know if that came up much in the qualitative portion of your study. I think you did mention something about how more men tend to become not religious and more women tend to become more religious. That was one of your findings. Can you say more about that? Yeah, that was hypothesized in the qualitative study where people felt like that that was happening when they looked around anecdotally, it seemed to be happening and nobody was really talking about that. And how could we, that's not separate from marriage rates when we're talking about women finding a spouse and more men leaving religion, these problems coincide. Um, and then the quantitative study revealed that absolutely about double the amount of men raised modern Orthodox currently identify as non-religious than women. Okay. I mean, that seems to require a study within itself that just makes me curious to understand more. But I would like to go back to your main findings regarding the pitfalls or the difficulties as were reported by your respondents mm -hmm. regarding the, the shit of system. Yeah, sure. And, and to speak to your point earlier, one thing I did do uh, was analyze some of these themes that emerged for differences between the modern Orthodox and the community and the yeshivish community. And I definitely would have guessed that there would have been some big differences here that maybe some, one community was talking about the pressure to get married or the use of shidduchim much more than the other community. And we found there really weren't such big differences in these qualitative responses. And that speaks to Michael's point that the modern Orthodox community seems to be moving towards a more similar system. Well, you know, one thing I would ask about that, and I don't know if this came up or not, but this was actually talked about in a recent podcast, one of the more yeshivish podcasts, and they were talking about what to reveal, what not to reveal, and things like when you have siblings who are, quote unquote, off the derech. I mean, just from living in a modern Orthodox world, and also having a lot of access to the more Haredi and more yeshivish demographic, it seems to me that something like having a child in your family who's not religious or being on medication for some kind of illness or something like that aren't going to be the kind of deal breakers in the modern Orthodox world than they are in the Haredi world. And that brought me to a question because one thing they said on the podcast was that if a young woman, I don't like to say girl, um, but if a young woman has a brother who is off the derech, quote unquote, it's much worse for her than if it's a young man who has a sister who's not religious. And I'm wondering if you knew why. I, I heard that and I'm like, why? Well, I don't know why people think that, but I can tell you it's not true. Because there's another paper that we didn't get to yet, but it's called Examining Age of Marriage that was written on this data set. And that paper actually looked at whether if you have a sibling that shifts from cult one subculture to another or goes off the derech, um, whether that affects age of marriage. And the answer was it, it didn't. So I think that's valuable information for the more Haredi community where they're worried about that. That's very interesting. But what about Tali's first point in terms of the difference between Haredi and modern Orthodox attitudes? For example, if somebody's off the derech, is there a difference between those two communities in terms of how they look at it? How, how close they are, how open they are, 
in other words, if somebody in the Haredi world sees that the uh, potential shidduch of that person's child has a sibling off the derech, is that more a problem in the Haredi world than it is in the modern Orthodox world? I would assume so, Dr. Solomon. What are your thoughts on that? I, I just, I, you know, speaking clinically, not from a research perspective, but clinically, it's interesting because it depends more on the family rather than where they align themselves with. Some families are willing to accept whatever they have to accept to keep their children involved in the family, and others are not. And that kind of is more a, a unique to each family type of response. You know, so we'll see plenty of Haredim who have people who've gone off to Dereth in the family, yet they'll keep inviting them and having them come over. In the modern or the Nats world, there's some families who won't. It's, I think it's worth a study. I haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah, but I also think we have to consider that if you have a system which begins the process by, let's say, uh, a match, there's a Shidduch resume, you look at all the different kinds of objective data, you can throw things out from the get-go. Whereas Except let if me interrupt you, you. you. Your premise of objective on a Shidduch resume is, is not necessarily true. In the sense that? And, and it's what's on a Shidduch resume is very superficial. Um, right. In fact, decisions are made based more on picture than on anything else that's written. And if you call, there have been many instances where we were told if you call up the references, you're not going to get a straight answer about the individual or the family of the individual. I think that's what I meant by objective. What I meant by objective, I meant superficial, you know, just the data, but not anything about the person, about their personality no. or about. So as opposed to if you meet a person organically because, you know, you were on a hike or you met them, you know, doing um, volunteer work. If you met your partner or somebody who you start to date in an organic way, you only discover these things in an organic way. Whereas if it's all on paper to begin with, there's going to be specific criteria. Oh, you know, they have a sister who is not religious, forget it. Or, oh, and this way, when you meet organically and you form an intimacy over time, also these things become, I think, less of a reason to throw away the relationship that's already been formed. Absolutely. And that was a top category that emerged, literally. Word that was for a top word. category. So a superficial criteria yes, in selecting and a yes. partner. And it's interesting that that was a top category because that means that this is what many people are feeling. But this isn't being spoken about in the media, in the magazines. And when you say superficial criteria, looks, socioeconomic status of the families. Where did their grandfathers daven? Right, right. My father, Oliver Shong, used to say, the only two questions you should be asking are, where did the person go to school, the person you're going to be dating, which school they went to, and where does the family daven, which school are they affiliated with? Everything else has to be organic. Meet, see if you connect. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's really how it was for our, you know, grandparents and great grandparents, or if it really was more arranged, and, or if it's more arranged now. Like what happened in the shtetls over there in Eastern Europe? Well, it depends. I, you, a lot of, look, again, anecdotally, you can read stories about how Shadokhan were made based on if you were from a rabbinic family, you married into a rabbinic family. If you were in the wine business, you married somebody who was in the, uh, the wagon business so you could take your wine to the market, things like that. Um, otherwise, if there was not, none of those pressures, then you met organically, and, and that's how you developed the relationship. Well, not to sound crude, but you made mention of the fact that it seems like it's a buyer's market for the men. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, that theme just wove through like almost every one of the other themes so much so I didn't even know where to put it. And that's why you find it mentioned often in the themes. You know, there is this perception that there are not enough men. We know what happens when there's a perception that there's not enough of anything that's important, right? What happens when there's not enough food? Well, a marriage partner is up there. So this idea that first the guy gets asked if he's interested, and then if he's interested, she gets asked. That's definitely how it works in the yeshiva system. Uh, Michael, is that how it works in the modern system as well? From what we've seen, yes. yes. Yeah, that's what I'm told too, yeah. And I think that first developed for a good reason. It almost felt like women felt protected. Like if he's not going to say, yeah, I don't want to hear about him. Save me some heartbreak. Right. So it was like, we don't want to mention it until 
what's typically called, you know, in the more yeshivish community, it's literally called until you get a yes. But a lot of people in the study mentioned that they now feel that that's become a problem for the woman because it gives men who are already sort of have the one up, who already in undersupply, even more power because they end up, I've heard that, you know, parents have told me that shadchanim are literally giving them lists of suggestions. They don't give, it's a one at a time, at a time suggestion. They provide here, here, here's a stack of 10 resumes, look through it. And then when it comes to their daughters, they sit and wait for months and months to quote unquote, get a yes. It's possible that a tweak in there, and this is why it was important for us to put that into the Jerusalem Post um, article as a real practical suggestion. It's possible that just tweaking that would will help. Just one at a time. Yeah, it's very objectifying. Really, it is. It seems like a very objectifying process. You know, not unlike some of the algorithm-based websites, which kind of take data and put people together that way. But those are suggestions. And people look at those suggestions, and they both have to match, and then they go out. So that's a little bit different, because I don't know why it just feels different. I want to ask a question about Shalchaniyot, or Shalchanim in general. And I wonder, almost given the call to buyer's market for men, it seems to me that there's a lot of pressure put on by some of the Shalchaniyot to close the deal, to seal the deal, to make it happen fast. I've seen many people who have been told by their shatchanit that, well, you've gone out six times, so either get married, get engaged, or it's over, because they get paid very often based on sealing the deal. So therefore, they're putting pressure. And it seems to me, perhaps, I assume this is in the more yeshivish communities or Hasidish communities than the modern Orthodox communities, although I think it's also infiltrated there as well. Have you seen that as a problem? And if so, what can be done about it? No, that was the next thing on the list, I think. The pressure. Right. Pressure, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right under superficial. Right. Certainly, I see that clinically. I see it clinically as well. It's 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 unfortunate. It's very sad. Uh, and and you also have these Russian yeshiva telling, you know, tell me them, you can go out five times or eight times and you have to make up your mind and move on. If not, and if, you, and if you're not sure, then, I don't know, whatever. some say you have to get married anyway, some say you have, you have to drop the person. You know, the, the pressure is just so intense. And if you look at the, the outside research from, from the general world, there's some data that indicate that you really get have to get to know the person over a good few months. Part of the issue here that I'm seeing, and we're going to have to look at it at some point in the future, is what is the actual divorce rate when people use shot fun? And I'm, I'm thinking it's higher than, than what we really want to believe it is because the pressure is so intense and people are thrown together. And they really don't know enough each other enough to maintain a relationship, let alone live together yeah. the rest of their lives. And, and divorce rates don't even tell us that much because they right. just tell us about the people who get out of the marriage. Divorce rates are on the rise, but part of the reason why they're on the rise is because there's less stigma attached to it and it's become more of a valid option. It doesn't make it any easier, obviously, but we can't really know how many couples have been miserable for generations <laughs> and didn't get divorced. But yeah, I mean, I think that the idea of pressure, not just pressure as to how many dates, and then you have to decide, but also pressure in terms of age, where young women as young as 20, 21, are feeling like they're already getting old and they're older singles. They're 21 years old. It's crazy. Yeah, I, yeah. I you know, I often see people like that in, in my practice that they're thrown together with someone, they don't feel like it's comfortable, so they decide they're going to take a break. And they turn 21 or 22, and suddenly they feel like they've lost all opportunity. And, and they're, they're, they're distraught beyond belief because of that. So again, in kind of delineating some of the differences, I think what we're saying is across the spectrum of orthodoxy, there are some very similar themes, even though it might be more extreme and less extreme in the modern orthodox, but they're still there. Yes. So for example, let's say in Haredi society where there would be more, let's say, racial discrimination, like it would be less likely for Ashkenazim and Sephardim to get married with each other, let's say for sure. A chassid from Williamsburg wouldn't necessarily marry someone's Sephardi unless 
know, there's quote unquote something wrong with him or something. In the modern Orthodox world in Israel, for sure, where, you know, we're culturally more integrated, it's not that big a deal. But having said that, in some families, it still might be. So it's less so. It might be there, but it's less so. And that could be true for things like certain chronic illnesses. You know, what do you want that for? But certainly nobody would be proud to say that out loud. I think that in the modern Orthodox world, one might be more hesitant to actually say something like that, say something like, oh, I don't know, you know, he's a Balchuva or something like that. You wouldn't, you would feel very uncomfortable actually admitting something like that, which is very standard in the Haredi world to say, no child of mine is marrying a Balchuva. Tali, I don't know if you saw, there was actually a movie there was an Israeli movie oh, yeah, called Bacharim Tovim. You saw yeah, it as well? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, it was a movie about some people who lived in that Bnei Brak. That was hilarious. It was hilarious. Yeah. It's an Israeli movie, a Hebrew movie about people living in Bnei Brak. And the yeshivish son of a prominent Ashkenazi family wanted to marry a girl who was from a Sephardi family. But both families couldn't understand why he would want to do that. So he had to feign blindness effectively to, in order to do it. It's actually it's funny because— It's a very funny movie. The movie was particularly funny for us personally because Aliza and I are both Ashkenazim and our daughter Tali married Shai. He is of Sephardi descent. He's Moroccan. At least from what I can see in the Dati Lumi national religious world, this issue of marriage between Ashkenazim and Sephardim is not a major issue at all. I haven't heard people talk about it in that way whatsoever, nixing Shiduchim because of it. On the other hand, at least according to the premise behind this movie, It's a major issue in some communities. So do you think, Naomi and Michael, that it is a major issue, this sort of racial profiling, when it comes to Shiduchim? In the modern Orthodox world, it exists, but at a much lower rate than the yeshivish world, at least in America, from what I've seen. We don't have data on that. It's not in the study. But I think your experience and, and my experience clinically and anecdotally supports that finding. The one thing we do know in our study, and it's one of the categories in the paper, is that Balchuvas have are saying they have a really hard time. So maybe it translates differently into our community, and it's not about Shvardi or Askenaz, but those that are Balchuvas have said that they feel alienated and they don't know how to navigate the system, and it's particularly hard for them. Because in the yeshivish world, parents are involved. That's also one big difference. I would say that we are less involved. Our kids generally do get set up, but they get set up by friends. They don't get set up by matchmakers. I think that another difference I was reading in your findings about the lack of education in the areas of forming relationships, intimacy, and sexuality. And I'm thinking about how, and this might be more to do with the Israeli educational system as opposed to modern orthodoxy versus yeshivish, but in my daughter's open out, especially my younger daughter, they spend the whole year on the idea of emotional awareness. They talk a lot about forming relationships. It's not just learning about Tarat Mishpacha in 12th grade. It's really a whole unit where there's also a lot of talk about like red flags in dating. Clearly, there's a lot more preparation. And even the social preparation, even if it's the same gendered social preparation, I think must be better in terms of authenticity, being genuine. Whereas in the yeshivish world, it's very much about image and behaving a certain way already from 11th and 12th grade so that you will be known as a girl with a certain reputation, a good reputation. Am I right in saying that? I don't mean to generalize. Yes, Yes, absolutely. And that was one of the categories in our study. And actually, that's one of the only categories that when I analyzed it for differences, this was something that people that were raised yeshivish were much more likely to report on. So I think you're onto something when you're talking about your children. And I know that's in the Israeli system, but I think it must, must translate to some extent here where It was really those in the yeshivish system that were asking and really begging for more education. They felt ill-equipped for marriage in multiple levels and areas of sexuality, intimacy, communication. Um, And this has to be offered to both the women and the men. It wouldn't be fair just to offer it to one gender. I think that the boys here, the young men here, certainly get less than the young women. But you just have to wonder, what do the young men get in the yeshivish system in terms of preparation for emotional intimacy, emotional exposure, vulnerability, empathy, like that's really all part of marriage preparation. 
Yeah. And people on this, you know, people that responded felt that there really was a mismatch between the emotional well-being, the emotional health, even the social skills of the woman versus the men coming out of the system. I'd like to ask a follow up on that. In terms of having this education, let's say, whether it's education for young women or young men, I don't know if you know the answer to this or if you said you address this at all. Is there any way to compare how much education can make up for a lack of interaction? In other words, in the more modern Orthodox communities, perhaps left-wing Orthodox communities, co-ed education, at least in the United States, is de rigueur. I went to Maimonides School in Boston, for example, where boys and girls were together in every class, including Gemara. There was no distinction whatsoever in our education except for gym class. But I'm wondering, for those who don't go to co-ed schools, for those who have much less interaction with members of the opposite gender, can education make up for that lack such that it really doesn't matter? And I say that as the parent of kids who go to centrist Orthodox schools in Israel or Dati Lumi schools in Israel, but they're almost all separate gendered here. So even in the same community that might be co-ed in the United States. So is that something which is a lack or is it something which can be made up via education and other forms? That's a very good question. You've, have you ever heard the phrase, um, they're letting him out of the freezer? Yeah, yes. I've heard that. Yeah, we've heard that. Okay. So that's the amount of education a lot of the yeshiva kids get. They have no interaction with, uh, these. we're talking about the, the, the young men, who when they turn 20 or 21, depending which yeshiva they're in, that's when their oath says, go date. They're let out of the freezer and that's it. There's no real education, no preparation. And they, for the most part, had very little interaction with their own female siblings because they've been in yeshiva most of the time. Even on their own Shabbat Tavot, they, they, don't, they don't hang out with their sisters much. And that's the extent of the education for a lot of them. There is not. And I don't think you can make it up by having a class, premarital class, that someone is giving them, which is basically mostly about Tarot and Mishpacha. I mean, education is education, but relational skills exactly need, to be, need to be experienced and taught. And if you're told, if you're actually raised in an environment where you're told the most important thing for you now is to learn and you don't have other responsibilities, there's very little emphasis put on relational skills. And those are considered, by the way, if you're the best person in yeshiva and you got that way because you've been starking away morning and night and have not had any social relationships and have not had any friends because you've been very focused on learning, ironically, you end up being the best you're considered the best match because you're the best in the yeshiva. But, you know, I wonder what that would really be for the potential partner. So I don't want to cast dispersion on the entire system, but I've heard many times over the last number of years that I've been in clinical practice, women who are married to men like that will say to me, my, my husband's having an affair with his gemara or with his kabusa or whatever. There, there's this lack of bonding that they feel because they don't feel that they can communicate their issues very well. Again, I don't think that's necessarily universal, but I've heard it enough times to be concerned about it. Well, I would create a parallel in the modern Orthodox world, at least here in Israel, where I've heard young women who are like wanting to start to date in their 20s, you know, they've done Sherut Lumi, but their counterparts are still in the army. And they'll go out with boys who are in the army and they'll say, they're not interesting. <laughs> All they talk about is anything having to do with the army. And that's like really boring. So I think that we probably see elements of these lack of relational skills in different types of societies within our greater Orthodox culture. Yeah, I feel like there's so much more work to be done here and really also so much more research. Are there differences in the boys that go away for high school? And they stop family interactions with their sisters, with their cousins, with their neighbors, where they might actually have opportunities to have some some form of interaction with the opposite, opposite gender in a quote unquote kosher and healthy way to help them build some of those skills versus the boys that end up in the yeshiva dormitories throughout you know their whole adolescence where they're really developing, supposed to be developing these kinds of relational skills. Lots of more work and research to be done here. You know, Tommy Chacham, with whom I'm close, uh, a Rebbe of mine, someone whom I love, told me years ago that starting his school, he didn't do this, but at least in principle, he had an idea that it should be done the opposite way that most people do it, meaning he wanted to have secular studies separated by gender, but he wanted to have Lima de Kodesh, 
religious studies, co-ed. And he said, because they need to learn, first of all, how to interact with each other. And would it rather that be done under the watchful eye of somebody who has Torah values? Or would it rather be done under the watchful eye of the math teacher who may not? And it's something which I've never seen anyone actually implement. And I think he didn't because practically it couldn't happen in right. that community. But at least in theory, it's an interesting way of looking at things. And I think sometimes what we need, I don't know what the solution is, is new thinking, new ways of allowing ourselves to break out of the boxes into which we're often enclosed. That's how I think about it. Very interesting. Very yeah, wonderful idea. That can never take place. Right. <laughs> Is it okay if I go back to something you mentioned earlier? At the very beginning of our talk, we talked about the people who, perhaps more in the modern Orthodox community, once they get into their 30s, they say that they're single by choice, so to speak. They're giving themselves more time to grow, more time dedicated towards their career. I wanted to ask about that phenomenon of single by choice, but not as you presented it on some level as perhaps a justification or an excuse, how much of that is real? Is that a real element? Are there people in Orthodox communities who really are single by choice as a recognizable phenomenon, or is it just Yechidim, individuals that don't really amount to a large group among the demographic? Again, I have to answer anecdotally. I think even those individuals who are busy justifying, rationalizing the, that kind of life approach are still looking to get married for the most part. I'm not talking about uh, those outliers who really don't care to get married, but in general, if, if you look at the people who, we the Upper West Side of, of Manhattan is it's often referred to as the place where the singles go, but there are other communities as well. There's one in Brooklyn, there are a couple out throughout the country in, uh, of America. If you really get into the discussions with them, those who are really committed to their, their, their careers and really want to make a life for themselves are still saying privately, given the opportunity, they want to get married. So if you want to be honest about it, um, we're not making it easier for some of these people to really meet. We have to find a way to make it work. So let's make this practical because people are listening and there are going to be single people listening. I think that we need to have more single people on to tell married people what to do. I know that I hear a lot that people want to be set up. They want to be thought about. They really do want you to say, oh, I know somebody. They don't want you to say, I know someone and he's single and you're single. So that must be perfect. They want you to set them up with somebody and kind of give them a reason why you think they might be good for them. But just in a general way, what are the take-home messages? And also, what have you found regarding singles who you interviewed who were past the age of 25, 26, but into their 30s or 40s, if you found things that they were telling you that were different, and what can we learn to kind of help out with the situation? Yeah, I didn't actually look at how it differentiates by age, but that's a really good idea. And I certainly can look at that. So I don't know what the difference is between the people that are in their singles that are in their 40s versus in their 20s saying, but I'm sure that there are differences. You know, there was a whole theme that didn't actually, it's Chaval, but it didn't make it to this paper. And that theme was titled Stigma and Singlehood. It just wasn't one of the most repeated. And I think the reasons why it wasn't is because we also included a lot of married individuals in the study. So that wasn't the first thing they were saying on such an open-ended question. But if we were going to only include those that were singles, I'm sure it would have made it to probably the top theme. So if I were to guess, I would think those in their 30s or 40s are saying, hey, I would like to be married and I'm not. That's A. B, the pool of men out there for me to date is difficult. I don't get dates too often. And when I do get set up, I feel like there's a real imbalance between where I am in my life and where they are. That's the second thing. I, I, I'm thinking that would come out. And the third thing is other than the fact that I am single, I would like to be included in the community. So this isn't just about getting me married. I feel stigmatized. I feel like there's not enough opportunity for me. It's in the overt and covert messages that are given. We need to create more space because we're a lot of people. Thank you for that, because I think that really hits the nail on the head. And you were talking about women. What would you say that the men would say? Um, hmm. 
I didn't get such a great grasp on what the men would say. I don't think they have as much to say. And this goes back to a point I wanted to make on what you were saying before, Dr. Solomon. I'm actually curious clinically and anecdotally if, if you also think that about the men, that they really would like to be married but aren't, or if they're actually don't want to commit and they're happy jumping from relationship to relationship. And it's really the woman that would like to be married, but aren't. That is the case universally. The research does show that. I don't have a good answer for that. I don't think anybody has a good answer for that, but we can look at it from, again, an anecdotal perspective. If you look at the, the number of men who leave orthodoxy completely, those are the men who are having a hot, fun time going and dating and finding whoever they can find to hang with. But I hear from men also, who want to stay in the from world to walk modern, that they can't find too many women who they want who want to go out with them. Um, I, I can give you actually, I spoke with someone a little bit earlier today who said I could use his name, which I would never do, but he's spoken to me about having the difficulty. He's 30, in his 30s, early 30s, he's having a hard time finding women who want to go out with him. He was in one career path, he's just switched, he's going to a profession now, so his income isn't great. And he keeps getting turned down because he has a, a, until the next two years, he may not have a decent income. As far as I can tell, he has pretty good social skills, but the women who he's being set up with want more stability, financial stability. Um, and he's feeling at ends. Now, can we make generalizations based on just that one individual? I don't know. I just don't know. I think we should wrap up. I just want to know, I know you two are, clinicians, your academics, but what do you advise in terms of looking? Do you advise going on these websites? Do you advise talking to all your friends? Or what do you tell singles who are kind of beginning to get anxious about it or concerned and are really looking for, in addition to coming to you, obviously, to work out whatever issues they might be having personally or relationally or increasing their own self-awareness, et cetera, practically speaking. And I guess maybe we could certainly meet with dating coaches on this as well. But what practical advice do you provide? I think there need to be more co-ed activities so people can meet, as you said, more organically. I think it's a shame that they are less and less available. I, I, I tell people that they need to speak to friends because friends are a better source of introduction than a lot of shot climbing. I, I tell people that they should not be afraid to date. If somebody tells them that they don't know if this person is good for you or not, but they're a nice person, I say, so why not? Go out on a date and see if there's something there. It doesn't have to be that rigid. The big problem seems to be that I'm hearing is that there's a certain amount of brainwashing that, that particularly the men are, are exposed to, and they're told that you're, if you date, you must date for the main goal of marriage. Uh, no, you have to date for the purpose of dating to see if the person is right for you. Then you think about marriage. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would say all of that. Um, I guess I would add there's something that can feel very validating when somebody's going through the process. Uh, to hear, you know, it's not you, it's the system. And I think that's one thing this research accomplishes, because there are many people that are experiencing this, but people, you know, we're clinicians, we're therapists, we hear it from people. So we have an understanding that this is not unique to one individual, we're seeing patterns. And I think taking those patterns and bringing it back to the community, we might not be able to solve the problem at the moment, but we could help people understand that it's much less about them and much more about the time and place and system that that they're in. I think that can be helpful. And also about flexibility, as Michael was saying, as well as just trying to enjoy the process. That's something I often tell daters I work with and friends. You don't know if this person is going to be for you and you don't know when you're going to get married, but can you enjoy your date? Can you enjoy your time? Can you look at it as it was Bashar that you were supposed to meet this person in this time of place. You're so you're supposed to do something for them. They're supposed to do something for you. Can you live like that for a little bit? Yeah, I think that's great advice too. Well, thank you both for joining us today. I can speak for both of us, I'm sure, in saying that we found this very interesting and enlightening, both the clinical research that you did as well as the practical advice you gave at the end. So Dr. Naomi Rosenbach, Dr. Michael Salomon, thank you very much for joining us today on the podcast. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. 
And thank all of you as well. Check out the website, IntimateJudaism.com, for our archives. Subscribe to Intimate Judaism wherever you get your podcasts. Continue sharing Intimate Judaism. Join us on Patreon. Write to us at IntimateJudaism at JewishCoffeeHouse.com. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.